So I'm sharing my screen. I hope that people can see it. And I see a yes. Yes. So I'm Suliana Manley. I'm very excited to be here with you today. And I'd like to thank very much uh, Mumita, Meredith, Sri, and Kim for organizing this fantastic series. It's really lovely to um, connect during this very disconnected and isolated time. So this first um, movie that I'm showing you uh, shows you mitochondria moving in a cell. And so perhaps you can already see why um, I'm so fascinated by them. Uh, each of these long strings is a, is a mitochondria and they, they can look quite different than what you're used to perhaps seeing in textbooks, these more bean shaped, um, smaller mitochondria. But really they take on a very wide range of shapes and sizes and um, we've been fascinated in my group about their uh, division process, their ge division geometry, and uh, how that's connected to their fate. So I'm going to reorient you because I know this is a very broad audience. So just to give you a, uh, a picture of what, where, we, where we are in the cell, we're looking at, we're talking about mammalian cells. And mitochondria are organelles within the cell. So the, the, the cell, of course, is packed with many different uh, subcompartments that take on different roles. And mitochondria are just one of them. My lab studies, in addition to mitochondria, um, centrioles, uh, which I know Tim is going to show you uh, some examples of centrioles later this afternoon. Um, and why are we so fascinated by mitochondria? Well, for one, uh, mitochondria are important. And so mitochondria are, as you know, uh, the powerhouse of the cell. They're the main reason that we actually breathe uh, to allow oxidative phosphorylation to generate ATP in mitochondria. But they're also very important for programmed cell death and many other cellular signaling processes. Um, but as biophysicists, I think we're even more fascinated by the, some of the constraints that are on mitochondria and their dynamics. And so we think about mitochondria and we think about the fact that they're actually ancient endosymbionts. So more than a billion years ago, um, uh, there was a, a precursor to the, to the mitochondria that was a, a, an alpha proteobacteria. And so you think about this alpha proteobacteria that contained all of its own genome as well as its division machinery. So this was, you know, taken over by the cell once, uh, the, once it was engulfed uh, in, inside of a eukaryotic cell. Um, but there are still certain functions which have been maintained within mitochondria, the core of, of which is, of course, uh, ATP production. And the proteins which are critical for ATP production are maintained inside of our mitochondria on their own genome. And so because mitochondria contain their own genetic material, they have to divide to proliferate. And so this sets important constraints on mitochondrial dynamics. And uh, so the genomes themselves have to be replicated and segregated and maintained over time uh, to maintain mitochondria. So what is known about mitochondria from a biophysical perspective? Uh, we know, for example, that at least in yeast, uh, uh, the, the genetic material, which are called nucleoids, are semi-regularly spaced along mitochondria. And so this was a beautiful example from the lab of uh, Johan Paulsen, where they showed that if you, if you look at the spacing, uh, the distance between nucleoids along the mitochondrial network, then you see that they're different than you would expect from random. They're more regularly spaced, meaning that there's an average distance which is greater than you would expect in a random distribution. On the other hand, there's a lot that's known about the um, molecular side of mitochondrial division. So this is a cartoon of what the complex looks like that's dividing mitochondria. And so I'm not going to go into all the details. The point is really just to say that there's quite a lot known about this. And what I want to point out is just that there are different stages to division. So it's understood that, for example, there are these contacts that form between mitochondria and this other organelle called the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, and that these contacts then are thought to stimulate mitochondrial DNA replication and the accumulation of the, um, uh, uh, the 
um, protein machine that then assembles and constricts. So the physical force that causes mitochondria to, to divide. And so there's this idea that this uh, cell-like uh, behavior of coupling between replication and division is, has been preserved or re-evolved in mitochondria. And so this is a, a, one of the things that, that has uh, fascinated the field and that has important implications for uh, the, how mitochondria should move and divide. So there are still a number of very interesting open questions that my lab has been focusing on. For example, what's the role of membrane tension? So the physical parameters of the membrane that, that give rise to fission. Um, how are mitochondrial transcripts stored and distributed in this network? Um, and then finally, how do mitochondria decide where and when to divide? And so these first two stories are actually on the bioarchive. And so I'm going to actually focus on this third question, um, which is how do mitochondria decide where and when to divide? And this is a picture of, of some of the wonderful people that have, I've had a chance to work with in my group over the past years on these questions. Uh, the, the work that I'll tell you about today has been led by Tatiana Cleel, who's a, a postdoc in my group. And so a key set of tools that we use and develop in my group are uh, super resolution microscopies. And in particular, we develop uh, high throughput implementations of these uh, microscopies. So why this? So high throughput because you know, biology is noisy. And if we wanna do quantitative studies, we need a lot of data. And so we wanna increase the number of, of data points that we get. And then super resolution, why super resolution? Because organelles are really small. So they're at the diffraction limit. You can see a mitochondria itself with a normal wide field microscope, but to really resolve the nucleoids and to resolve the division sites requires super resolution. And so my lab has focused on two different aspects of high throughput, as I said. On the one side, automation. So the idea that if you can um, mechanize a microscope to take data on its own, it'll be more efficient than a human, and so it'll give you more data. It's also more humane. <laughs> on the other side, there's parallelization. And so here you could imagine many microscopes working in parallel, um, but even though we're in Switzerland and we have great funding, we can't buy, you know, 10 uh, super resolution microscopes or build them. So instead, we, what we do is we create really large field of view microscopes. And I'm going to just show you a few examples of that on the next slide. I'm trouble with my moving to the next slide. Here we go. And so here you can see three different examples of what I mean by high throughput. And so in this first case, we've in, increased a lot the, the field of view by creating a very flat illumination. This allows us to take advantage of new large uh, camera detection chips. And so we're able to take 150 by 150 micron images that are super resolved. And so these, um, the, the resolution is about um, 30 nanometers across the entire field of view. And so we can collect really um, large and uh, uh, high quality data sets this way. In the middle image, what you see is a waveguide. And so each of these little spots is a nucleus of a cell. And so you can see that this is a very large substrate. And what's special about it is that we're using as a substrate for the cells here, a waveguide. Um, and the light is basically leaking into this um, imaging area, creating an evanescent field. So this is a total internal reflection uh, waveguide that we can then use to do super resolution uh, what's called paint. So here we're painting a sample using dyes that come and bind and unbind. And in this way, we can reconstruct super resolved images. And we did this, uh, for example, for DNA origami. And so these are some examples of individual DNA origamis that we measured. And we could then average these DNA origamis and see that they were spaced, you know, less than 20 nanometers apart, these individual binding sites on the DNA origami. And finally, we are always fascinated by dynamics. And of course, mitochondria being so dynamic, we've taken advantage of a, uh, um, an advance in structural illumination microscopy it's called instant structural illumination microscopy that gives you about a factor of two improvement in resolution, in spatial resolution, 
and it's super fast. So it goes up to 100 frames per second. And what we've done here is to improve the illumination on this setup so that it's also flat. So we can again use the full field of view and collect really high quality data across a large field of view. And in fact, it's so fast, this 100 frames per second, that we don't often need that time bandwidth. And so we can further increase our, our throughput by imaging multiple fields and then coming back to the initial one. And so in the corner here, you see a montage of three by three um, images that were stitched together. They were taken in four and a half seconds and you can then create a whole dynamic uh, time series in this way. So that gives you a clue into the kinds of tools that we've been developing. And in fact, uh, we've used these tools then to, I'm having trouble flipping my slide. Um, oh, good, okay. Um, we've been using these tools then to collect large data sets of centrioles, as I mentioned before. So in this case, we're collecting you know, images of thousands of centrioles, and we can then use tricks from electron microscopy to reconstruct uh, the, the highly detailed or arrangement of, of centriole or proteins now in multicolor, which you could never get with EM. So I won't go into the details of that. I just wanted to, to share with you one of the directions that these technologies move us in. So now I'm gonna shift back to these questions about mitochondria that I posed, and in particular, this one about mitochondrial division. So we're basically applying this ethos of collecting you know, lots and lots of information about these heterogeneous biological processes to this question of mitochondrial division. And so here I'm showing you just the part of a data set that shows um, and, and each of these uh, images that you see in this montage is a single snapshot that's taken from a, a, a time series. And this snapshot then has, was chosen because it's the frame just before a mitochondria divides. So each of these mitochondria that you see in this montage is a different length. Some of them even are branched as mitochondria do. And this yellow arrow shows you where the mitochondria is about to divide in the next frame. And so you can see that mitochondrial division is really quite diverse, it's quite heterogeneous compared to say bacterial cell division, which is highly regulated, happens at a particular location, sometimes right in the middle, sometimes it's slightly asymmetric, but it's, it's much more um, a, a tight process compared to what you see for mitochondria. And so it's really, there's quite a diversity of, of fission when it comes to mitochondria. And so I'll take a, a, a very brief pause here to say that when we first started looking at mitochondrial vision, I thought, okay, so the picture I had in my mind was that mitochondria, you know, are these kind of beans or maybe branched beans. Um, and all along the mitochondria, they're sort of similar, except for at the ends, right? Geometrically, at the ends, they're quite different. Um, and in far, as far as what's known about the protein distribution, it's also thought to be, you know, relatively regular along the length of the mitochondria when we talk about the scale of a micron or so. So there may be differences locally, you know, infoldings of the membrane and so on. So I would have thought coming to the, this question of, of where mitochondria divide, that you would see something like mitochondria can divide all along their length except at the very, the very tips, the very poles. And so um, what we saw was something which was so different than that, that I was completely shocked. <laughs> so this shows you um, what it looks like when you plot a histogram of the number of fissions um, as a function of the position along the mitochondria. So each of these numbers is, is a, when a single mitochondria divides, where did it divide along its length? And it's shown here as a, as a percent of the, the total position. So um, from the, from the midplane being 50% uh, and the tip being uh, zero. And so you see that there are these two um, uh, subpopulations in the distribution. And so we call these mid-zone and peripheral fissions. And so there are a bunch of questions, of course, that this raises 
And um, this is unpublished data, and, and more than that, I think it, the, the, this, this uh, story opens more questions than it answers, which is one of the things that I love about it, actually. <laughs> but one of the questions that it raised was, um, you know, after we said, uh, what the heck? Uh, we said, um, okay, well, is it real? You know, and is it, and is it, um, is it important? Does it, does it show up in more than just our, our cultured uh, cancer cells, <laughs> cross seven cells? Um, and so uh, Tatiana, um, who takes uh, that question very seriously, uh, decided to go and talk to some collaborators at the University Hospital who um, could give us these primary cardiomyocytes, so no longer um, is these immortalized cell lines, but now um, primary cells. And so she did this uh, a very similar set of measurements. And here what you're seeing are little arrows that show up whenever a division is taking place. Um, so you can see these divisions yourself, what they look like in these primary cardiomyocytes. And what she found was that indeed um, in these primary cells, you still see a, um, oh shoot, a huge, uh, um, a huge sort of depletion of divisions that takes place at a very similar location to what you saw for the cos 7 cells. And so there is, again, this um, peripheral versus mid-zone fission. And so now, you know, that we felt more confident that this thing is real and that it's, um, it's taking place in more than one cell line and that it um, takes place over thousands of, of divisions, we could move on to ask questions like, why is this happening? And how does it happen? And I think, you know, for, for me as a biophysicist, I think the question of, of how is probably the most fascinating, you know, because you come up with all these ideas about what, what it means to be positioned. And, you know, is there a gradient like there is for bacteria? Um, but here, for this, the purposes of today, I focus more on, on why, because we understand this better. And um, so I'm gonna share with you our explorations, um, Tatiana's explorations of this question of why are there these two populations? And the hypothesis that, um, that we came to was that there are really these two different roles for fission. So on the one hand, you need fission to proliferate. So you need a mitochondria to make a mitochondria because it has a genome. Um, and on the other hand, uh, though, it's been uh, well described in the literature that you need to divide mitochondria to throw them away. So basically for degradation in the case of quality control to remove damaged uh, mitochondrial DNA or mito uh, mitochondrial proteins, uh, you need to divide off pieces of the mitochondrial network. And so there's this uh, really seminal work uh, that was published by, by Twig in Embo Journal um, that proposed this kind of life cycle for the mitochondria where Mitochondria undergo these solitary periods and more network-like periods, um, and then they can undergo a fission, and then they, deep, they, they um, lose their membrane potential. In the case that they, uh, over long term, lose their membrane potential, then they get taken up into these um, degradative organelles called autophagosomes, so they undergo uh, autophagy, which is now called mitophagy or they recover over time and then they kind of redo this life cycle. And so um, there are these two roles for fission. And so we wondered whether these two roles for fission were um, uh, coordinated in these two populations that we saw. And so Tatiana went and she looked at these two different uh, types of fission, peripheral versus mid-zone. And she looked at all these different physiological markers um, including the reactive oxygen species levels, the pH of the mitochondria, and the mitochondrial membrane potential. And I'm just going to quickly show you um, what she found. So what she found was, so she's using these fluorescent sensors for these different aspects that I just described. And this is just to show you what they look like before and just after fission. And um, then she did the statistics. So she, she studied this over many fission events. And she found that consistently um, mitochondria that were these little daughter mitochondria that came from these peripheral fissions tended to have a reduced membrane potential, a reduced pH, and an elevated level of ROS. And so this is all consistent with the idea that these 
peripheral fissions, the small mitochondria tend to be um, ready to go toward this mitophagy pathway. Um, and this is in contrast to mitochondria that divide uh, in the mid zone or the larger mitochondria that come from these uh, peripheral fissions. And so, not anticipate this issue with changing my slides. Here we go. So, um, we, she then went on to look more closely at other factors involved in um, proliferation and degradation, these two different pathways. So, as I said before, the ER is known to be very important in proliferation. So, it, it's thought to coordinate um, mitochondrial DNA replication with division. And so, we looked at the presence of the ER um, in these different types of fissions. And so, here you see the ER um, uh, stained together in purple together with the mitochondria in green. And you can see that in this mid zone fission, you really get a peak in the ER showing you that there's this ER contact. And so Tatiana again quantified this and found that um, for these peripheral uh, fissions, you often had no contact with the ER, whereas for the mid-zone ones shown in green, uh, 25 to 50%, you often get this contact. Um, we also, she also looked at DNA replication, so are the replicating nucleoids of the mitochondria, are they present in these small uh, um, peripheral fissions? And typically, the answer is that many of them have no proliferating um, uh, nucleoids, and in fact, no nucleoids at all, um, compared with the other types of fission. Um, she also you know, directly damaged the mitochondrial DNA uh, using UV ra irradiation. And she found there that actually then you start getting quite a lot of mitochondrial DNA. It's not proliferative, but our picture is that we think that it's probably being sequestered for degradation. We would love to be able to, um, there are no tools right now directly at um, you know, which nucleoid is actually damaged. So we're doing more of a bulk assay here. Um, and then finally, she also looked at factors linked to degradation. So those are all linked to proliferation, linked to degradation. There are a number of different contacts that are known to be important that happen before mitophagy. And one is interactions with lysosomes. And again, you know, the mid-zone ones don't make contact with lysosomes, the peripheral ones do. Um, interaction with the autophagosome, we see these interactions with the autophagosome. So everything's kind of pointing in this direction. We see the, the molecular components assembling that are responsible for mitophagy. So everything points in this direction. Um, and I'm going to uh, skip forward a little bit because I see that my time is running short. Um, I'm going to skip forward. And so I'm going to say that, you know, what, what Tatiana has discovered is that there are these two different geometries to fission, and they're really um, spatially separated. There's this um, more symmetric uh, mid zone fission that leads to proliferation that has all the ha hallmarks of mitochondria reproducing themselves. And then there's this very asymmetric. Uh, peripheral fission, which uh, is, is upstream of degradation. Of course, this doesn't answer the burning question of how it does this, but this is something that we continue to work on. And so with that, I will just um, thank the, the members of my team, uh, uh, past and present, as well as our fabulous collaborators, and I'm prepared to take any questions. Thank you, Suliana, for a wonderful talk. So I will ask a few of the questions that are in the chat box. Meanwhile, you guys can unmute yourself and ask questions after that. So I guess the first question we have for you is, uh, so uh, how, can you tell us something about the variation in the lengths of the mitochondria? And this is a question from Sri Ayer Biswas. Yes, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question and something we've thought about, especially when we ask this question of, of, of how? Um, so I, I I'm actually can show you. Yes. So here's uh, here's the plot um, in the in the lower left corner here of the distribution of lengths of mitochondria. And so you can see that they have quite a broad distribution. And in fact, they can even be all interconnected. So what we're what I'm showing is just you know it's truncated at some point. Um, but this is what it looks like. Um, 
Is that, I hope that answers the, the question. Yeah, so it's, it, it, is, it does have a peak to it. And we thought about this as maybe one of the reasons uh, or one of the ways that, that it can actually um, uh, have this uh, kind of separation of, of length scales, but it's not clear how that would lead to that. So Liana, quick follow up. This is an asynchronous population. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Next question from uh, Brian Camley. Uh, does the location of the mito ER contact drive where the fission event happens? Ah uh, yes. So um, there are a number of works, uh, many from Jody Nunari's group, that uh, point toward this um, this connection between the mito ER contacts and the, the mitochondrial fission. And so we also see uh, mitochondrial contact, ER contacts prior to these mid-zone fissions. And so, um, you know, a, one of the things that's interesting is, you know, does it happen right at the division or near it? And some of the work from uh, Jody's group shows that it doesn't happen right at the contact, but it's sort of within a micron, which is quite large a, a distance actually. Um, so it's, it's nearby, but it's not smack dab on it. Okay, and then uh, Meredith Betterton has a question about uh, uh, the quality control aspect. So she asks, after peripheral fission, is the whole mitochondrion degraded or just one of the parts? If so, which part? And is there some hypothesis that bad slash damaged parts get pushed into the part that is degraded? Yeah, this is, oh, this, I love this question. It's something that, I've, uh, that has <clears throat> I, drove, drove me a little bit crazy at times, the, especially the last part of that. So the idea is that this whole small peripheral fission is being degraded. We don't have direct evidence for that because we can't follow each and every one of them. We would love to be able to do that, but the tools are not there. Um, but this question about how the heck does the damage get sequestered there I think is, is, is a burning question. Because when we look at the, the, the transport properties inside of mitochondria, they're super packed, first of all, and they're also full of these cristae, so infoldings of the inner membrane that make diffusion very slow. And if you look, for example, at nucleoids, or um, we've also looked at mitochondrial RNA granules where our mitochondrial RNA is stored, they really don't move. They hardly ever move. It's ex it, it, so how, does, how would damage then get pushed toward the ends? And one could imagine a sequence of, of fission events that eventually gets you to the end, but transport, I can't imagine. I just can't, I can't imagine it based on what we've seen. And I guess I, we will take one question from David Lubensky now and then move on to the next speaker. So David's question is, is there nucleoid occlusion in these divisions? And if so, how much of the distribution of division locations is explained by the non-random distribution of nu nucleoid positions? This is, uh, yes, this is one of the, the main directions that we've been trying to investigate along is, is it the nucleoids that are determining? Since it's already known that the nucleoids are non-randomly distributed, then it would seem logical. Um, so one thing we looked at to try to answer this is, uh, you know, uh, when the mitochondrial machinery, uh, division machinery, uh, DRP1, comes and assembles, it's not always successful. So we wondered whether those reversals, as we call them, are due to nucleoid occlusion. That is, the nucleoid is there, and so it's physically preventing the mitochondria from dividing there. In that case, you would see assembly of the machinery everywhere, but reversals, particularly at this 25 to 30 percent location. And this is not what we see so far. And we're, we have to collect more data. It, these are large, these uh, data re, um, kinds of conclusions require large statistics and we're not there yet. Um, but I think that this, this kind of path is the right way to, to, to address that. I, I love that question, thank you. Thank you, Suliana. So I guess we will now, this was a wonderful talk and also thank you all for your questions. There will be more time to ask questions in the 15 minutes after the talks. Yeah, I'll stick around afterwards if anybody wants to talk to me. Thank you very much.